So this revision video is going to look at the processes operating on a conservative plate boundary. Um, there's less going on here, I suppose, than maybe at destructive or constructive boundaries, uh, but still some important processes that lead to the formation of earthquakes. Um, you can see on this diagram here um, that we have two bits of lithosphere um, that are sliding side by side. The, the movement within um, a conservative plate boundary um, is a parallel movement where the plates are either moving in the same direction um, or at different in at different speeds, or they're moving in opposite directions. So we can see um, in this example here that we've got one plate moving in one direction and one plate moving in the other direction. Now, because they are huge slabs of the Earth's lithosphere, they don't slide past one another um, nice and smoothly. What we end up with along the boundary between them um, is a huge amount of friction um, pressure building up between the plates. Um, the plates will get locked together, um, that friction will, will build up um, until eventually they jolt suddenly. So it's not a smooth and continuous movement, it's a sudden and jerky movement um, of the plates. That movement releases energy which we feel on the surface as earthquakes. Now what you can see, each of these orange dots here perhaps represents um, the location of an earthquake that's maybe occurring along that boundary and we can see that actually they're all relatively shallow. They don't extend deep down into the lithosphere um, like they might do at a destructive plate boundary um, where you have subduction going on. They're very shallow so although the earthquakes might not be huge in terms of their magnitude. We tend not to get magnitude eight or nine quakes at this sort of boundary, but magnitude five, six, seven earthquakes are quite common. Um, the reason that then those magnitude sixes or those magnitude seven earthquakes can actually um, punch above their weight, if you like, is because they are quite shallow and so that energy is being released quite close to the surface. Um, as you can see from this diagram, we don't get any volcanic activity at a conservative plate margin. That is because um, there is no subduction going on and the lithosphere isn't being stretched um, and thinned in order to allow the magma to reach the surface. So we don't associate these boundaries with um, volcanic activity, but we do associate them with seismic activity. Um, with earthquakes. You'll notice it uses the um, term here transform fault. We have come across that already when we've looked at constructive plate margins where two bits of um, the plate slide side by side. So the same thing is happening here. So you may come across um, these boundaries as being called um, transform boundaries or sometimes you also come across the term strike slip boundary. That's another term that we use for conservative plate margins. Most famous example um, of a conservative plate margin is probably the San Andreas Fault um, in California. Um, in this situation, rather than the plates moving in opposite directions, they're actually both moving um, in the same direction. We have the Pacific plate and we have the North American plate. Um, and they're both moving in a north westerly direction. They're both moving upwards in, in this direction here. What happens though, because the Pacific plate is faster than the North American plate, um, it's basically overtaking it. And as it overtakes it, um, we get a huge amount of friction being generated um, along that boundary. And you can see um, the fault line is marked by the black line and um, the potential impact of any earthquakes um, is shown here. So the orange and red areas are where um, earthquakes would have the greatest impact. And we can see that um, areas such as Los Angeles um, or San Francisco, they are particularly prone to um, shaking in result of um, earthquakes along this boundary. Um, some notable earthquakes have happened in those places. So San Francisco, um, 1906 and 1989, very, very devastating earthquakes um, up in San Francisco in that year. Um, and even quite recently, um, Ridgecrest in California um, in July 2019, a magnitude seven um, earthquake. There have been other notable earthquakes um, all along that uh, all along that boundary, but certainly Los Angeles and San Francisco are the two cities where um, there is perhaps the greatest risk from 
um, earthquakes. Another example that's worth being aware of because um, it will tie into one of the case studies that we will we will look at um, is the fault lines that run through Haiti in the Caribbean. So we have um, the Caribbean plate here. Um, we also have the North American plate here, the South American plate here. Um, and although there's some subduction going on over here, creating um, the island arc of the, of the Lesser Antilles, in Haiti, um, and indeed through into Jamaica and Cuba, um, there is a transform boundary, what it calls here a strike slip fault. Um, it's the same thing happening here. So the Caribbean plate is moving east, the North American plate is moving west, and there's a couple of fault lines um, that accommodate that movement. And one of those runs right the way through um, the capital of Haiti, Port-au-Prince, um, which was just nearby to where the epicenter of that earthquake was um, back in 2010. So Haiti also sits on a conservative plate margin um, where we have two slabs of the Earth's lithosphere moving side by side. So again, the Haiti earthquake was not a particularly large magnitude earthquake. It was only a magnitude seven, um, but it was pretty shallow. It was only eight to 10 kilometers deep into the crust. And that was one of the things that meant the shaking was actually quite intense um, in the capital. So that rounds up conservative plate margins, two slabs of the Earth's crust moving parallel to one another, either in different directions or at different speeds.